Hello, welcome to SCP-140's discussion of the evolution of stars. We're gonna start with chapter 17 in the text and move forward through all the chapters that discuss how stars change over the course of time. Now, when you look at stars in the sky, you're looking at a brief snapshot in their lives, even the stars that live the least amount of time will survive for millions of years, which is extremely long in human comparison. But there are some stars which are as old as our universe, 13.7 billion years, and aren't even beginning their lives. How do we know all this? How do we know how stars are changing over the course of their lives? Well, what we do is we take pictures of all the stars. In much the same way you might take pictures of a huge group of people and see a young person, an old person, middle-aged people, and so forth, and make judgments about what a human life might look like. We're doing the same with stars. So here's a picture of some stars. We've got red stars, blue stars, bright stars, dimmer stars. And we'd like to use all the information we can to figure out what is going on when stars are created, as they grow, as they start to shine, and when they eventually stop those processes, what happens to stars? The first thing to understand is that we need methods to figure out what the properties of stars are. We already know how to measure the temperature of stars. We know how to measure how much light they're giving off if we can figure out how far away stars are. One thing we would like to know about stars is how much actual material is in them. What is their mass? It also would be nice to know what their physical size was. It may seem in pictures like this that there are stars that are bigger than others, but what we're really looking at here are brighter and dimmer stars. When you take a picture of the sky, a bright object will appear to be larger than a dim object. But in this situation, essentially all of the points of light that are in this picture are the same size, indistinguishable from a single point. To figure out how big the object is, you have to use some clever logic, understanding, and calculations. But this is possible to do if you know how far away the star is, how much light it's giving off, and what processes are causing that light to be created. You can then work out what the physical size of the star might have to be. One thing we can look at when we examine stars is the spectra that comes from them. And the spectra that come from stars are different colors of light that we can see at different intensity levels, depending on whether there's a lot more red light or a lot more blue light. So you can see we have a number of different stars labeled by what we call spectral type, starting at spectral type O and going down to spectral type M. And we can see a variation in red light and blue light in all of these, but we can also see that there are some lines, features in these stars that show up at different temperatures in different colors. These lines are associated with atoms in the chromospheres of these stars. And these atoms are all present, but it's only at particular temperatures that they become dominant in the spectrum. For the sort of medium hot stars, the A stars, some of the B stars and some of the F stars, you can see some very dark absorption features. These are the hydrogen, the Balmer lines of hydrogen. It was, in fact, these lines, which were what allowed the great astronomer Celia Payne Kapashkin to figure out that stars had to be 
composed mostly of hydrogen. And indeed, we now know that the universe is essentially 90% hydrogen by number. Working out all of these things have allowed us to understand stars in a way that wasn't possible when we first started our observations. We've now worked out what the sizes of various stars are and have discovered some objects that are so small that they can't really shine the same way that stars shine. Remember that stars shine by nuclear fusion that happens in their cores. Well, there are some objects that are smaller than stars, but shine through the heat of formation. As you form the object, it heats up, and that heat allows the object to shine. But eventually, that heat will dissipate, and it will stop shining. Some of these objects also have some small component of what we call deuterium fusion. This is a type of fusion that can happen in objects before they become stars at a slightly lower temperature. And these objects we call brown dwarfs. Brown because they're sort of reddish and dull in color, not very bright. And dwarfs because they're quite small. Whether you call these things a star or not is sort of a, an argument in definitions. Most people would say that a star needs to have hydrogen fusion happening at some point in its life to be properly known as a star. Brown dwarfs don't have that feature, so perhaps they aren't stars. But then the question becomes, what differentiates a brown dwarf from a planet? Well, some people say it's the deuterium fusion that's happening in certain brown dwarfs. Others say it's not so clear, that there might just be a gradation from stars through brown dwarfs down to planets. Well, in any case, we're showing a lot of these different objects in this image. And it's an interesting topic to learn about, cutting edge science, things that are being done with the new James Webb Space Telescope, and some of the most interesting things to learn about currently in astrophysics. There are a number of astronomers studying this subject carefully, and many brown dwarfs are extremely close to us. There's far more of them than there are stars. and They show up as objects that are close to our own sun compared to the stars, which are a little bit further away. Some other things we might observe about stars include the kinds and intensity of the spectral lines that we see from them. Here are two different kinds of stars, a blue giant and a white dwarf, which have the same temperature, but you can notice very different features in their spectra. The white dwarf have extremely deep and broad spectral lines, while the blue giant have very narrow ones. This is due to the movement of the atoms in the atmosphere of these stars. In the white dwarf, the atoms are moving very fast, and that means that we see a wide range of possible absorption features. That's the broadness of the absorption lines. Whereas in a blue giant's atmosphere, the atoms are not moving nearly as quickly. And so we see those lines in very particular, precise, and specific wavelengths. Another thing we can examine about the spectra of stars is whether the lines are in the wavelengths we expect them to be according to the observations we might have of them here on Earth, stationary in the lab. Sometimes we see the lines redshifted, which is indicating that the star, or at least the atoms that we're observing, are moving away from us. Sometimes we see those lines blue shifted, which means the opposite. The atoms are moving towards us. Sometimes we can see that shift go back and forth over the course of some sort of motion that might be periodic, perhaps indicating an orbit. Here's an example of what that looks like, looking at two stars that are orbiting around each other. And if the two stars are basically the same mass, they orbit around a common center, as you can see here. If they have spectral lines, 
you might see them separate and then pass each other as they become red shifted and blue shifted, much as you see in this diagram. And measuring that motion and that separation and how long it takes for that separation to change can tell you a lot about the orbital conditions of a binary star like this. That allows us to measure something called the radial velocity. This is something that you're going to be doing in the homework, looking at the radial velocity, not of stars, but of not of not of two different stars, but of a planet and a star. You'll just be able to see one star and be able to measure its radial velocity change. And that should tell you that there's a planet moving around it. In this diagram, we're actually looking at two separate stars, one that's a little bit bigger and one that's a little bit smaller, one that has a high velocity, that's the smaller star, and one that has a low velocity, that would be the larger star. You can also examine stars and see them move in real time if you spend enough time doing the observations. Here's one that happened over 20 years, watching a star move across a star field. That's called proper motion. If you imagine waiting 100,000 years, all the stars in the sky would be moving. So 50,000 years ago, the Big Dipper looked very different than it does today. And 50,000 years from now, it's going to look different still. When we think about measuring stars and figuring out their masses, this is the game we play. We look at the motion of two stars that are orbiting around each other. And because we know that gravity works very well across the universe, we can use the laws of gravity to figure out how massive the stars are. One way to think of this is that a big star is gonna move little and a, and a small star will move a lot, basically on the principle of balance. Here we balance a low mass star with a high mass star around the center of mass. So the motion of the high mass star will be small, and the motion of the low mass star will be large. After doing this for enough stars and comparing how much light is given off by these stars, we can figure out that there's a relationship between the amount of light given off by a star, the luminosity, and the mass of a star. This is what the relationship looks like. It's roughly something we call a power law which is to say I should be able to raise mass to a certain power, and that should be directly related to the luminosity. When people try to do this more accurately, they might have two or three power laws that they put in. But knowing the mass of a star tells you automatically the luminosity, and because it's easier to figure out the luminosity of a star, we can use the information about the luminosity to tell us the mass. And that's exactly what we do in HR diagrams. There are other ways of discovering what's going on near stars. For example, a transit of a star by a planet can tell us something about a planet orbiting a star. And you'll have a question that deals with this as well. Now, this is a cartoon version of what's going on. When you observe a star in the sky, of course, you see a single point of light. So you can't tell that there's actually a planet that is casting a shadow on the star, except that if you monitor the brightness of that star over the course of some hours, you'll see a tiny little dip in that brightness. And that dip's size tells you how big the planet is blocking light from that star that it's going in front of. So putting together all the information we know about stars and how bright they are, what colors they are, gives us this HR diagram. Most of the stars in the HR diagram are on that main sequence, running straight down the diagonal line. We, of course, also see white dwarfs and red giants and even super giant stars on here. And some of the more important stars are labeled. There is, of course, a homework question that asks you to figure out various features of stars on this diagram. 
But this diagram can be divided in many different ways. Here we indicate the different types of giants, the sequence that's the main sequence. Most of the hydrogen burning stars in the universe are on that main sequence. Red dwarfs at the very edge of the main sequence and the white dwarfs, which are very hot and small. Putting this diagram together has told us a lot more about how stars behave. It's a little bit like organizing a picture of all the people that you might take a picture of and trying to decide what different features they have, how big they are, how small they are, how much energy they have, and so forth. One thing that astronomers do is identify different classes of stars. So there's the white dwarf class of stars, which are the smallest. And then the most numerous class of stars we call the main sequence. And that gives them the class of five. So other than the spectral types, O, B, A, F, G, K, M, which indicate the color, the temperature of stars, we also have these luminosity classes, how bright they are compared to other stars that are along this diagram. Right above the five luminosity, we have the giants, four and three. And then there are the supergiants, two and one, that are the most luminous stars for a given spectral class. When you look up stars and start to tell us about them, you will find that this luminosity class goes at the end. So if you see a five, you know you're talking about a main sequence. That's a Roman numeral five. If you see a four or three, it's a giant and then twos and ones of the supergiants. Well, what do we mean by supergiant? Here's an example. This is one of the biggest stars we've ever discovered. Just by looking at its luminosity, knowing how far away it is, we can figure out that it has to be absolutely enormous. Our sun is a tiny little dot by comparison. So putting all of this information together tells us something about how stars grow and what their lifetimes are like. We see stars associated with each other in things called groups. The youngest groups show up near things called molecular clouds, dark nebula, where they're barely breaking through. And some of the most beautiful pictures we have are of these nebula, the Orion Nebula, the Eagle Nebula, and so forth. And you can see the protostars and the newest stars breaking out of those molecular clouds. After some time, we might see a young group of stars at some distance away from a molecular cloud without any nebula around it. We can tell that they're a young group of stars because there's a lot of blue stars in them. The blue stars don't live very long. Maybe they live only 10 million, 100 million years. And so if we see them in a group, we know that the group itself can't be much older than those blue stars. It's only the oldest groups where we see a predominance of red stars and very few blue stars. In fact, you wouldn't see any blue stars at all in billions of years old groups, except that every once in a while, you end up with systems where stars merge together and form bizarre things we call blue stragglers. So there are always a few blue stars in these groups. But for the most part, we see only a certain level of red stars, and the groups become redder and redder and redder the older they are. How do stars form? Well, you might not be surprised to find out they form through the process of gravity. And as a cloud of material collapses and becomes denser and denser at the center, material starts to spin around and heat up. Now, under just the normal circumstances of physics, you might not expect it ever to heat up quite so much so that nuclear fission, fusion would happen. But there are processes which allow for the energy and the angular momentum, the motion in circles and around and around, uh, to be carried away so that the central concentration becomes higher and higher, the temperature becomes hotter and hotter. And that's what eventually forms a star. This is still very much a mystery that people are working out. But since we see stars, we know that they must form. So we know that something is happening to 
break all of the conservation that would prevent a star from forming. There's a lot of different explanations for what this, these processes are. These are called cooling processes, but we know that they occur and we see stars all around us throughout space. So how does this happen? Well, we can sometimes just follow the tracks of these protostars as they start off until they hit that main sequence on our HR diagram. Here's some examples of those tracks for protostars. They start off very red and also quite bright. They're bright because they're very large. And so even though they aren't giving off a lot of light in comparison to the area that they have, the individual slice of the area, because they're so gigantic as protostars, the giant clouds around them, they end up being on whole much more luminous than when you end up with just the concentrated star at the center, even though it's shining more brightly in a given area. We say it's more intense. These are some of the tracks that these protostars travel when they move from just being formed as clouds all the way down to the main sequence. And you can see that they take as few as a few thousand years and as many as a hundred million years to form as stars. Well, what happens when these stars end up using up all the fuel at their center? Then they usually have spectacular deaths, at least they look spectacular. This is a star similar in size to our own sun, where material is being pushed out that was in the outer envelope of a red giant. After the so uh, star uses up all of its fuel at the center, it starts to expand and cool off. And that's what forms the red giant stars. But eventually those red giant stars end up losing those outer layers and you form these things called planetary nebula. This is an example of one. The name planetary nebula seems to imply that there are planets involved somehow, but really it's just an accident of when people were looking through telescopes. And when they saw some of these nebula in the telescopes, they thought they looked similar to planets in our own solar system. They're nothing to do with each other. They just look similar in the telescope. Here we have some different endpoints for stars. You start off with stars that have a hydrogen burning core and an envelope around it. And eventually you start to form helium at the center through the fusion processes. That's essentially what our sun looks like today in B. Once that helium core takes up all of the possible hydrogen burning locations, you end up needing to have different processes take over. And this is what forms red giant stars. Kind of in the reverse from the formation of protostars, giant stars move back into the points on the HR diagram that the protostars were in. And here's some example of those tracks. Most of these happen over the course of some millions of years and a few up to some billions of years. The smaller stars take a lot longer to go on these tracks. And the hotter stars, the larger stars, uh, they can go on these tracks over the course of let's say 10 million years. So let's think about a young cluster of stars. How do we know it's young? Well, if we look at all the stars in that cluster and put them on something like an HR diagram, it might look something like this. This HR diagram is showing us what would happen because some of the stars haven't yet contracted completely. They haven't yet reached the main sequence. They're still protostars. But older clusters of stars kind of do the opposite, where you're missing a lot of the stars that are at higher luminosity and higher surface temperature. And the ones that are hotter and at higher luminosity seem to be moving off the main sequence. It's because those stars have used up all their fuel and they're now transitioning into giants and supergiants. 
This is what an HR diagram looks like for a very, very old cluster of stars. This is a so-called globular cluster of stars called 47 Tucane or 47 Tuck for short. That turnoff you see where the main sequence kind of does a little hook and drag and zip up, that if it's measured exactly precise, will tell you the age of the cluster because you're missing all the stars that are at higher luminosities. And so that is the precise age where that cluster is. This is the, what we might say, the heuristic for how that works. You start off with something called a zero age main sequence HR diagram. And as time goes on and you don't add any new stars, you get this little hook that comes off lower and lower down at lower and lower luminosities, telling you that the cluster is aging. As these stars transition away from the main sequence, they become so-called red giants. This is one of the most famous red giants, Betelgeuse. It's in the upper right-hand corner, sorry, upper left-hand corner of Orion indicated in this diagram with the um, bright diagonal spikes. This is actually a picture taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And it's such a large star that we can just barely resolve the disk, even though it is a star that's very far away. Almost every other star would be resolved as a point. We can tell that it actually has a physical size. Well, we say that the stars move off as giants, but then what happens? Well, different things are happening in the core. The core ends up collapsing, heating up, and other fusion processes happen, and different shells and different layers. First, you get a shell of hydrogen that burns, and then you get a core helium that burns. And this can be associated with flashes, where the star gets much brighter and then dimmer and then oscillates back and forth, sometimes as a variable star call that the instability strip. These things that are occurring over the giant star's end of its life are extremely important for understanding what the eventual fate would be. For a low mass star, you end up with a planetary nebula with all this material coming off. For a high mass star, you might end up with an explosion. So this is what a medium-sized star may end up like, perhaps one a little bit bigger than our sun. It'll have a core of carbon and oxygen from all the helium fusion that's going on. There might be some helium fusion happening beyond that. There's a helium core where there is no fusion. There's some hydrogen burning beyond that. And then there's a hydrogen envelope around it. Eventually, however, it runs out of steam. And those outer layers are going to end up getting pushed off and you'll end up with just the carbon oxygen core. That will collapse down to something about the size of the earth. That's what becomes a white dwarf star. This is what a white dwarf looks like. Well, it's two different views. In A, we're seeing a normal star we call Sirius A. It's a roughly an A star next to a white dwarf star, Sirius B, which is this tiny little dot in the lower left. That same orientation is shown in B. However, you can see that the Sirius B star is much brighter than the A star in indication B. That's because we're looking at these objects in X-rays. White dwarfs shine really brightly in X-rays. They're very, very hot in comparison to the other stars that are out there. So here we have this tiny little star which seems very dim in optical light, but very bright in X-rays. That's a white dwarf. This is how you get a white dwarf. You end up in the end of your giant phase and you form this planetary nebula. The material goes away and you kind of zip down around from A to B to C, and C is where you end up as a white dwarf. This is the eventual fate of our sun. But what about a much more massive star? Well, these are what the layers of an extremely massive star will look like when carbon and oxygen fusion can end up happening as well. 
You'll have other sorts of fusion happening, magnesium, neon, and oxygen, silicon, and sulfur, all the way to iron. Iron fusion can happen, but it doesn't release extra energy. It requires energy input. And that's actually catastrophic. So once you have a giant star that starts to form iron ash at the core, it's a ticking time bomb and an explosion is about to happen. And this is what such an explosion looks like. This is a supernova. And when a supernova happens, the explosion will outshine the star by something like hundreds of billions of times. One of the biggest explosions, you can see them all the way across the universe. This is one particular kind of supernova called a type two supernova. And the last one that was within some 10,000 light years of us was seen in a different galaxy, the Large Magellanic Cloud in 1987. We think the rate of supernova going off in our own galaxy is about once every 100 years. One might go off in my lifetime. It would be pretty bright in the sky. If it was close enough, you could see it during the day. Here's a remnant from a supernova that went off in the year 1006. Now, that's a thousand years we've had for this supernova to cool off. When you take a picture of it today, it's easily visible in the x rays. It looks kind of like this bubble, which is the shock wave that's been transitioned outwards from where the supernova happened. What gets left behind are bizarre remnants, not too unlike the white dwarfs we were talking about earlier, but these cores are no longer carbon and oxygen atoms that are sort of stuffed together. What ends up happening is the atoms themselves get crushed down into neutrons. And you end up with a star that's, instead of being the size of an earth, like a white dwarf, with densities that are thousands of times higher than the densities we have here on our planet, this is something that might be more dense by factors of millions and is perhaps the size of a city, 10 kilometers across, spinning sometimes close to the speed of light. We call these things neutron stars. And as they spin around, their beam might pass in our direction. And if we're pointing a radio telescope towards these objects, we'll see a blip of radio emission. We call these things pulsars. This is, in fact, the object that I study for my own research. All sorts of bizarre things can happen in addition to the formation of these neutron stars and white dwarfs. For example, if I have a binary star, one star might end up going into the death phase before the other. And you could have a situation like this, where you end up with a different kind of supernova, a type 1a supernova, where a white dwarf explodes. And it explodes because it ends up gaining more and more material and getting crushed essentially under that material. These types of 1a supernova are important because they always shine the same brightness. And this has allowed us to measure distances very accurately in our universe, something you should investigate in the chapter, chapter 22. Now the very largest stars in our galaxy will explode and the remnants we believe will end up being black holes. And we've identified a number of black holes that seem to be the result of such things. Perhaps the most famous one was in the constellation Cygnus. It's called Cygnus X1. This is an artist's impression of what it looks like. Next to a large blue giant star, that material is being pulled off and funneled into something called a black hole. We often think of black holes as being objects, but they really aren't. There's no surface to a black hole, per se. There's something called an event horizon. Objects can fall into that event horizon, and once they do, there is no escape. Not even light can get out. That's the definition of a black hole. You have a homework problem that asks you to calculate some things about black holes. We've also seen evidence of black holes through things called gravitational waves. These are disturbances in space-time predicted by Albert Einstein's equations describing general relativity and only just now observed 
with the amazing devices called gravitational wave observatories that have been built and been monitoring the sky over the course of some decades. When you have a number of these observatories online, you can see when the disturbance happens at a number of them and figure out what has precisely gone on by the shape that's observed at these observatories. What we normally see are the mergers of two black holes, getting closer and closer in, spiraling down, and then becoming one. That does a lot of disturbance to the gravitational wave environment, and that's what we can observe. And this has allowed us to measure many more black holes throughout our universe. In fact, we've been able to discover black holes that are a bizarre range of masses, much bigger than our own sun, finding some that are about the size of our sun, and then many that are much, much larger, merging together, perhaps eventually becoming the supermassive black holes that we find at the center of every galaxy, which we'll explore in a future lecture. So that's what I wanted to share with you today about our exploration of stars and the end of their lives. I hope you enjoyed that exploration. Stay tuned for two more lectures, one on galaxies and one on the cosmology of the universe, which is to say, looking at the universe as a whole, where it came from, where it's going, what it's made out of, and some of the deeper questions about the existence of reality itself. Thanks very much. Enjoy your day.